so the uh, uh, challenge of a every obstetrician, uh, midwife, anyone who attends birth is uh, to recognize that not every pregnancy will become an infant. And that is a biologic reality. Uh, it's not quite as bad as the you know, pictures of the sea turtles on the beach and the, and the you know, seagulls, but uh, there's a challenge to end up with the baby in your arms if you're uh, a human female. And our goal is for every infant to be healthy to a healthy mother every time. Uh, obviously, uh, that goal is, like most goals, never perfectly accomplishable, but in the state of Texas, it seems to be much more challenging here than uh, most other places in the uh, Western world. So everything I'm gonna tell you is a fact out of a medical textbook. And the first fact is women risk their life with every pregnancy. So if you have 100,000 women in the room, one room here and 100,000 over here and they're all pregnant, more women in the room with the pregnancies are gonna die in the next year than the women with no pregnancies at any age group. Uh, any race, economic uh, identifier, that is a reality. Uh, to put it in somewhat perspective, uh, you probably can't read this, but uh, 9.7 per 100,000, according to the CDC of women between the ages of 25 and 35, died in a year. Uh, and the risk of mortality in that similar age group for pregnant women was 22.8. Uh, so uh, every pregnancy has a risk of death. And uh, so when they you know, pass a law that says it's up to the physician to decide, is there a risk of death? She's pregnant, there is a risk of death. That is a biologic fact. The other fact, which uh, is an inconvenient fact for many, is uh, if the woman is pregnant, if she gets an abortion, her risk of death goes down dramatically with that pregnancy. That is a fact. Early abortion is a very safe procedure. It's nothing's 100%, but those are the best statistics we have that have been shown every country on earth, every society, everyone who honestly looked at the data. So those are two facts which uh, have been lost in all of this conversation. Um, the next fact is where do babies come from? Uh, there's been a huge push to make every pregnancy a baby, and most babies come from a pregnancy. Uh, the day may come where all of them don't come from a pregnant woman. Uh, they're working on that, but uh, at this point in time, every baby came from a pregnant woman, but every pregnancy doesn't become a baby. So, quick review of biology here. Um, for those of you who don't know, the ovaries make eggs. The eggs get fertilized in the abdominal cavity in a typical pregnancy. We're not talking about REI or IVF or any of that stuff. Um, the sperm meets the egg in the abdomen. The tube picks it up. Uh, that fertilized ovum becomes a single cell, turns into two cells, four cells, 16. And the fallopian tube picks that process up and moves it from the abdomen into the uterus. Uh, there are some names you're getting ready to see. Um, hit the wrong button there. Uh, this various bunches of cells here, uh, they have some names which really aren't that important. But once that bunch of cells implants in the uterus, uh, it becomes a gestational sac, which can be seen with ultrasound technology. Um, that gestational sac will differentiate into an embryo, which after a period of time, with organ formation, the embryo becomes a fetus, and then uh, that fetus can come outside the maternal body at different times. If it's at a time where uh, the fetus can live outside the mother's body, either with no help or with technology help, like in an intensive care uh, neonatal unit, um, then that fetus can become an infant, a newborn uh, child, an adult, and if they're male, they revert to child at about age 40. So <laughs> that's how it goes, and I think in this room, everybody knows those are facts. Okay, so uh, this is my source for the next few slides, embryogenesis. So the one thing I want to really point out, many of these laws define exactly how many days 
from a pregnancy. I want you to pay attention to the colored squares here on the top line. They're a big square, not a point. So every woman that ha is having menstrual periods, sometimes it's a day, sometimes it's five, it depends on the woman. There's a range of biologic normal variability about that. There's a range of normal biologic variability about when they ovulate after that menstrual period starts. Once they ovulate, that egg doesn't have to be fertilized instantly. It can hang around in the maternal abdomen for up to three, definitely, and some say up to maybe even seven days to be fertilized. And then once that fertilization happens, it's a variable amount of time before the fallopian tube picks it up and starts moving it into the uterus. I think that's important because many of these laws will, t will make it look like this is a German railroad where everything happens instantly once the egg comes out, and that is not the way it happens, ladies. I think most of you know that. So uh, anyway, uh, so that's an important concept. Uh, these, you know, people, they like to have these firm rules, but there's a lot of gray stuff going on, and the clocks are not all set like uh, they are now. It's like the old days where my watch said one thing, the clock on the wall said something else, and then you go to somebody else's house and it, they didn't set it for daylight savings time. So um, uh, things can happen with the clock. So this is a cartoon of what happens. Uh, again, one to two cell stage after fertilization, the tube picks it up as that sac, which is encased the darkest line around there is called the zona pellucida. Around there, that's called the zona pellucida. That holds all those cells together uh, until it implants. It implants at about 32 to uh, 64 cell stage inside the uterus. And uh, once there's a, over 64 cells, it's termed a blastocyst. And the blastocyst is what many people call the gestational sac, but it's really that fluid in the blastocyst there. That's an important concept when you talk about gestational sac, because I'm gonna show you some real pictures later uh, to, again, inform you that it's not quite that uh, obvious. So that sac implants, and then in the blastocyst, that little, uh, it says inner cell mass on the slide. Some of those cells differentiate into placenta and some differentiate into the early em uh, embryo and then fetus and then child. So that's the cartoon picture. Okay, so uh, we already talked about the timing. A day or two can make a huge difference in early pregnancy. So this, the picture on the left is a drawing of what it looks like under a microscope of a 19-day pregnancy, 19 days after fertilization in a laboratory. This is 21 days, and that's 22 days. 19, 21, 22. So you can see 48 hours is a huge difference between this nothing but a stripe to where you can actually see some things happening. So again, the biologic clock is very rapid and it makes a huge difference and pretty much all of these laws don't account for any of this stuff, especially when they start saying, well, this is when something happens because it doesn't happen that quickly. In terms of the terminology, because as that embryonic pole is changing and becoming an embryo, organs, every different organ, bones, tissue, kidneys, liver, bladder, head, everything is being formed. And that formation is very rapid, changes literally hour by hour for about eight weeks. But by about eight weeks, most of the organs are formed. And when you say fetal heartbeat, the fetal heart is not present until about eight weeks. There may be stuff going on to make a heart, but uh, it's, there is no heart formed, so that's just a fact. Um, interestingly, uh, that was an inconvenient fact, so they came up with a fetal heartbeat is a, a bunch of cells, and I think everybody's seen a, you know, a picture of a heart. It, 
you know, it doesn't look like something that's been in the blender. It, it has pieces on it that are, you know, in a certain order. Okay, this is just a graph. Every line is different organ systems. And you can see there's incredible variability where some of these organs, systems, aren't even completely developed until after birth, like the brain. Uh, everyone's seen a neonate. They can't walk and talk and track. You know, their brain is not fully developed, and it doesn't get fully developed probably till they're about, you know, 22 years old. Um, uh, functionally, I mean, that, that's, that's a true fact. You know, a 16-year-old does not think clearly like a 25-year-old might. And uh, so that's just a reality we have to deal with. So this development is ongoing, and there is no firm, hard mark. So that's development, embryology, where the terms come from. So the next thing which I think is important is uh, how do you diagnose pregnancy? Well, in medicine, uh, diagnoses are made by the story, the history that someone tells us. I'm just making sure I know what time it is so I can speed up. Um, but uh, history, physical exam, and then laboratory tests and imaging. That's how we make a diagnosis. We get information, we put it together to paint the picture of what is going on here, and that's a medical diagnosis. I want you to pay attention to the pregnancy test is a hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin. Uh, that hormone is just a protein. It can be made by lots of different things. Most commonly, it's made by a fertilized ovum and those cells that we looked at, but it goes away after the pregnancy goes away. But cancers, tumors, uh, specifically tumors of the liver, lung cancers can produce that protein. So someone, uh, a male, could come in and have that hormone in his body uh, from a cancer, but he's not pregnant. So the pregnancy test is not necessarily a pregnancy, and that's a very important concept to remember which I think gets lost in a lot of these uh, laws. The other thing I just want to skip over briefly is the shorthand. You might see this. Uh, uh, many of you may know this, uh, but this is how uh, physicians who take care of pregnant women or women in general communicate with one another. The G refers to gravidity or number of pregnancies. The parity is the delivery event, but um, someone who loses or a pregnancy is removed with some outside influence early before the woman goes into labor, that's not called parity, that's called an abortion, okay? And then in the shorthand, we also include how many living children does that woman have because that paints very quickly a reproductive picture of the reproductive life of that woman who may be a patient in your waiting room. Uh, if they're there for something like that. If you're there because um, you have high blood pressure and you're 75 years old, they may not really talk about that. But for women uh, between the ages of 10 and 60, you may see that on medical charts, and that's what it refers to. And it's just a code word where we can relay a lot of information uh, internally uh, without saying a bunch of words. So, what is a pregnancy? Uh, again, most of you have seen a picture like this. Again, the dark line here is the zona pellucida. Uh, and in one of the recent Texas law, the so-called trigger bill, they mentioned the zona pellucida. They say in that law, by legal definition in Texas, once that sperm penetrates that membrane, that's a person in Texas law. So, that's where we are, and I'm going to tell you these are both pregnancies that were formed by a sperm penetrating the zona pellucida. This is a molar pregnancy, and this is a baby. This is cancer, which can kill you. This is a baby. They both started with a sperm going into the zona pellucida. So that's our next topic, gestational trophoblastic disease. We just went over normal fertilization. Uh, in the sperm, there's 20 three sets of DNA to make 23 chromosomes, one of which is an X or a Y, which assigns gender. Uh, in the ovum, there's 23 sets of DNA chromosomes. So once the sperm and egg meet, there's 23 pairs or 46 chromosomes. 
and if it's XX, it's a female, and if it's XY, it's a male. So the sperm can have an X or a Y. The egg only has Xs for the gender. In gestational trophoblastic disease, what happens is this is the ovum, this is the sperm. So you have a sperm with 23X going into this, and that first cell division is the sperm's DNA without the mother. So all 46XX is all from the father. And if that splits, it doesn't make a baby. It makes trophoblastic disease, which is at mass of cells in the placenta, and that can become a malignant cancer. Uh, it doesn't have to be a cancer. It can just keep growing, and the woman can bleed to death from the blood going through that tissue. Uh, the early diagnosis is incredibly important because just like with regular pregnancies, the earlier you make that diagnosis, the better things work out. Um, and it's difficult because everything's really small. The cells are just like the other cells in a placenta, but they're not programmed to do what a placenta does because there's no embryo that's ever going to come, so they don't act normally. And um, the only way to figure out was that... A 20, a 46 with mommy baby DNA or all from the dad is to get a piece of tissue and do some laboratory analysis on that. So um, if you don't get that tissue, you can't treat the patient correctly and they can die of the gestational trophoblastic disease. It was a very common cause of maternal mortality until someone figured out a chemical, which we now call chemotherapy of methotrexate, to stop those cells dividing. Uh, and that was in the 19, late 40s, early 50s. And that cured that cancer. And uh, has anyone ever heard of molar pregnancy before in this audience? OK, a few. So somebody might have had one. Maybe you had a neighbor whose daughter had one or something, but uh, they're about five per thousand. When I worked at Parkland Hospital, we'd see at least one or two of these a week. Now, we also did several thousand ultrasounds a week, but we would see one or two every week. So uh, just let's go back to our cartoon of the uterus. The one on the left is the normal pregnancy that implants, and you get the little sac. And the one on the right is the molar pregnancy where there will never be an embryo. You just get sac after sac after sac where it looks like a bunch of grapes. Okay, so that's a molar pregnancy. The problem is some of those grapes can turn into cancer. They can get in the veins. They can metastasize. And it's like any other cancer that is metastatic. So that's pretty complicated. But on top of this, sometimes women can have twins. So... If you have one of your twins as a molar pregnancy and you got a regular baby, that's a problem. That is, uh, and treating that is against the law in the state of Texas today. Go to prison for life. Because to treat it, you have to empty the uterus. And if the uterus has a mole and a baby in it, or embryo or fetus, um, then you've done an abortion. Whether... Uh, again, in Texas, if you remove the molar pregnancy, that's defined as an abortion, which is an error because it's medically incorrect, but that's what the law is. So uh, we're up to uh, having the Attorney General's office interpret that law for us. Um, to make it further complicated, there's a such thing as a partial mole, which uh, doesn't happen that often, but just know it can be very complicated where you have a normal embryo and a partial fetus, which this fetus will never, uh, there might have been one case that lived to three months of age, but it's a fetus with a heartbeat, but the vast majority die within five hours of birth because every cell has bad information in it and they're just not designed to survive. So what is the treatment? Um, basically, we have to make the diagnosis first. As I mentioned, uh, it's placental tissue, so they have high levels of the pregnancy hormone. Sonography, especially early, you can't really see much stuff, um, but uh, sonography is useful. And uh, sometimes 
the woman's bleeding, you have to make a decision what's going on here. Uh, if you treat the bleeding, the pathology lab, there's specific things. Uh, you can see microscopically to say this is molar tissue, not normal placenta, but you have to send that tissue to the laboratory to get that determination. And so it's not an easy diagnosis to make. It's critical you make it in a timely fashion. And uh, we have long conversations with patients trying to explain this to them because if they'd never heard of a molar pregnancy, this is a lot when you're go you come in excited and someone says, oh, this might be a cancer. And so that's a big, big change in attitude pretty rapidly. And that's what we used to do in the clinics. And now they tell them to go sit in your car. So, uh, which, uh, if you think that's the right thing to do, vote accordingly. Uh, anyway, methotrexate is a treatment of choice, which also happens to be a drug listed now as an abortion agent in the state of Texas. It, um, I don't want to violate any confidentiality, but some, a lot of people take methotrexate for uh, other reasons, uh, kidney disease, psoriasis, arthritis. Uh, it's a commonly used drug for lots of things, including cancer. Uh, now in the state of Texas, methotrexate is an abortion law and you can go to jail for life for giving it to a pregnant woman. The problem is, if it's a woman, she might get pregnant while she's on it. And uh, so I'm the doctor, I've written a prescription, and, oh, and then someone gets mad and they sue you and, and then you go to jail for life. So uh, obstetricians and uh, family practice people and uh, other providers of women health in the state of Texas, we have major problems. Let's move on to ectopic pregnancy, because that has also been in the news. Um, for those of you who don't know, ectopic pregnancy is a uh, pregnancy someplace in the woman's body other than the corpus of the uterus, which is the big kind of T-shaped area. Uh, all these other places are ectopic. I want to point out that th that is an intramural pregnancy down here in the lower right. Uh, that's also an ectopic pregnancy because that will rupture the wall of the uterus and the woman will bleed to death. So it's called an ectopic, but it is in the body of the uterus. Also, uh, down in the cervix, a cervical pregnancy, that's part of the uterus, but it's ectopic because it's not in the right place in the uterus. So these are life-threatening conditions. Mortality of the mother is high. There is no transplant to move that into the right place, as is promulgated in the uh, lay press. Because if you Google it, you'll see things going, oh, well, they can just put that in the right place. Well, that's nonsense. Uh, you cannot do that. No one's done it. So, uh, but that, that's the world we live in. So how do you make that diagnosis? Again, a tricky diagnosis. Uh, you use the same pregnancy test, the same ultrasound, uh, and you try and figure out, is this a normal pregnancy? Yes, no. And if you think it's an ectopic, you need to do something. And the things you can do is... Uh, Try and make the diagnosis correctly, which requires a lot of uh, good ultrasound skill, lots of visits, those kinds of things. Um, they have something called a discriminatory value of how high does the pregnancy test have to be before you should see certain things in the uterus with your ultrasound with our current technology. And these are all technology-based uh, tests. Um, the next thing is, what does a normal intrauterine pregnancy or IUP look like? Um, wh what level of uh, HCG should you have and expect to see things? Because if, if the HCG is high and you don't see what you're expecting, then that implies this is not a normal pregnancy. Uh, we need to do something because if it's an ectopic we can't find, uh, we need to take care of it before it kills a woman. So this is a review, quickly, of the cartoon of what a uterus looks like with an early pregnancy. This here is what an ectopic pregnancy looks like. I want you to note in the picture here with no colors on it, you see the little dark thing? That is what an early intrauterine pregnancy looks like, or it also happens to be what a blood clot looks like in the uterus and you can't really tell with an ultrasound. In this particular patient, you can see this is a false finding here, and the 
gestational sac with the embryo is circled in yellow over on the right. So this is an ectopic pregnancy. It just has an ultrasound finding in the uterus that looks like it might be in the uterus. To make it even more confusing, there are reported cases where it's a set of twins and one's in the uterus and one's out in the tube ectopic and that's a different kind of problem. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, treatment for ectopic pregnancy, methotrexate, if you wanna avoid surgery. Uh, is there anyone here who would prefer surgery over taking some pills or getting a shot? Okay, well, then methotrexate is the drug for you if you have an ectopic pregnancy, but unfortunately, it is defined in Texas state law as an abortion drug, and this is the rescue bill that was passed at the very end of the last session, making it uh, an exception uh, this is just a surgical treatment for ectopic. Um, the uh, Texas law, as I mentioned before, says an ectopic has to be outside the uterus. That is incorrect. Um, and as of September, the affirmative defense means you can still be sued, you can still be arrested, but if you're treating an ectopic, oh, and it turns out to be an ectopic, presumably, you are right. I mean, no one's right 100% of the time. Then you have a defense so you don't have to go to jail for life. So that's, that's our new law, uh, which it, it's nice that someone's thinking about us, but uh, probably, why don't you just let us do what we need to do? So that's, uh, by the way, ACOG's position is let the doctor and the patient decide what they want to do. So I saved the best till last abortion. Again, these are the uh, chapters they come out of. So when you think of abortion, abortion just means the pregnancy ends before it can live outside the uterus. So that timing isn't a bright line, it's a big gray area. And in some cases, even if the woman's full term, 40 weeks pregnant, the, the fetus is not gonna live outside the uterus because it doesn't have lungs or it doesn't have a head or something else. Uh, but um, those are just some biologic realities that uh, we have to deal with. A spontaneous abortion is when this happens without any outside interference, uh, except maybe the environment. Like if you live in a community where there's lead in the water, there's a lot more abortions. Or if you uh, live in a place where you can't get insulin for your diabetes and you get pregnant, you have a lot more abortions because the environment for that embryo is not conducive to normal development. So, so a spontaneous abortion happens. Many people call that a miscarriage, okay? Induced abortion is caused by a medical intervention. Okay, and we have, uh, as we all know, that is not allowed in the state of Texas. It's illegal to do an induced abortion in the state of Texas, with some exceptions. So these are the slides that I show the medical students, just so they are aware when they hear stuff on the news, see it on the internet, what are people talking about? So in spontaneous abortion, there's really five specific things that we use to diagnose spontaneous abortion. One is threatened. That just means the woman's pregnant. She comes in bleeding. Uh, she gets an exam. Everything looks fine. She's just having some bleeding. And we don't know, is that bleeding going to increase and her cervix is going to open? Or is that bleeding just going to stop? Because some bleeding early in pregnancy with that implantation uh, is observed relatively commonly, but 20, 30% of women will have that, just a little bit of blood for a day or two. But if she happens to come in that day, you don't know. We can't see the future. Uh, we just have to go, well, everything looks fine. We'll just have to wait and see what happens over the next day or two. Uh, inevitable abortion is early pregnancy. If the cervix is open, that is not going to work. Uh, that is just not how the human body is designed to carry pregnancies. So we know that will not work um, from experience, and that experience is thousands of years old because Hippocrates wrote about this. Um, incomplete abortion is where something has come out, <coughs> uh, but they're still having the symptoms and bleeding. Uh, so sometimes maybe the embryo comes out and the placenta doesn't or vice versa, and that's called an incomplete abortion. And because of the symptoms, that requires some intervention basically to stop the bleeding uh, most of the time. A missed abortion uh, is where 
a woman knows she's pregnant, we know she's pregnant, and then we have diagnosed intrauterine fetal death or embryonic death. Uh, you can do that with the pregnancy test. If it's going down, that's not normal. You know something's not going correctly. Uh, or you can see the fetus and see there's no heartbeat on the ultrasound. So that is uh, uh, embryo or fetus in the uterus that is dead, but she's not having any symptoms of labor. Uh, so that's a missed abortion. And uh, some women choose to just wait and let nature take its course. Some women uh, don't like the concept of walking around with a uh, dead fetus in their body and they want some help that day. So uh, that's where the conversation between the uh, provider and the patient is important. And then the one that uh, has been in the news a lot is uh, no matter what kind of abortion it is, if there's clear evidence of infection, that requires immediate medical attention. And that is called a septic abortion. And these are the cases that have been in the news uh, where uh, women had this. But uh, the problem with some of these, because induced abortion not allowed in the state of Texas, uh, the ones in red, they may come in and there's a fetal heartbeat. They still need care, but the embryos might have a heartbeat when they start needing the care. And these are the cases that have been famously put forth where she's bleeding and they told her to go sit in her car until you pass out. And once you pass out, then we can help you. Or the woman who they said, go home, and then she ended up in the ICU and got, you know. So all of these have been in the news. Uh, and this is what's going on with these cases. Uh-oh. Ah, so, facts. Um, pregnancy termination is a reproductive option in many of these complications. Um, uh, fetal anomalies historically has been an indication for abortion. If you know the infant will die in the delivery room because the fetus has a condition that you can diagnose and you know what's gonna happen, Historically, that has been an indication for abortion is currently against the law in the state of Texas. Uh, maternal disease or illness, if you know someone has a high chance that the increased cardiac output that happens with pregnancy is going to be fatal to that woman, that's where, does that condition maybe harm her? And that's a potential exception under Texas law currently. Um, but that's a judgment call, and again, it involves Someone saying, I know what the future is, and um, I don't think, hopefully, no one would make an investment because someone says, I know this will make money because I know I've lost money after they told me that. Um, so predicting the future is always dicey. And um, so knowing exactly who's going to die, that's, that's why some people are going, well, let, let's let her start dying first before we do anything. That way we can be sure that she's really dying. And... Um, uh, that's uh, not a place, not a good place to be, in my opinion. So, uh, spontaneous abortion. The facts are, of, we have our room full of 100,000 women, uh, and all of them get pregnant at the same time. Uh, within six weeks, only 75, maybe 80,000 will still be pregnant because they have early spontaneous pregnancy loss. Um, but they were pregnant enough to know they got pregnant. We know from doing research with the sensitive pregnancy test that in addition to that 100,000 that knew they were pregnant, if you had 120,000, some of them got pregnant and uh, the fertilized ovum or those early cell stages they didn't implant, you can see the evidence they were pregnant, but they just thought they had a period. They didn't even know they were pregnant. They didn't have symptoms. It just never implanted, and it was a pregnancy loss that they were just unaware of. So the point is, there's a lot of biology where there's losses of pregnancies before we even get to the point of what we're talking about in Texas law. Um, and interestingly, some of those spontaneous abortions could be due to environmental issues. We talked about lead in the water. There's some other things. There's a whole body of literature about situations that increase the chance of spontaneous abortion. Now, you really can't say 
lead in the water causes abortion because if you're given somebody, no one's going to do that experiment to give a bunch of pregnant women lead and all that. So uh, we have these associations, some of which are tighter, some are looser, but that's what the internet's full of, and I'll let you do that research yourself. Um, some of these early abortions, we do know the cause, uh, and it's an internal cause, and it's chromosomal, uh, the mechanics of how that fertilized ovum is supposed to go. Does it work right? Or people have known uh, carrier traits, and that's where genetics comes in, and so there's uh, such thing as recurrent or uh, uh uh, repeat abortion, and that's a medical problem that uh, we're not going to really touch on today because, uh, fortunately, those are relatively rare, but they do happen. Um, one thing, if you take the time to read any of these abortion laws, uh, one of them driven by uh, SB8 had a lot about the Rogam, uh, and just be aware that anyone that might be pregnant, we always want to know their blood type because if they're Rh negative, you can prevent problems in a future pregnancy by giving them Rogam. That is a blood product. It's expensive. Uh, we have guidelines to use where only women truly at risk get the Rogam. Uh, the recent Texas laws kind of drive it where a lot of women get the Rogam even if they don't need it. And so uh, we have pointed that out. Nonetheless, it's still in the law. Okay. Um, Again, this is the slides. I Literally, I'm going to give this to the medical students tomorrow morning. Uh, they're in clinics with an ultrasound. I do not want them to touch an ultrasound machine to say, I don't see a heartbeat. Because in Texas law, there's specific how many minutes, who's watching, what kind of machine, all this stuff. They don't know that. I just, I just don't want them getting hung up on something uh, where they have a problem uh, they, they uh, really shouldn't have to deal with. Um, the point is, ultrasound is mentioned in many of these laws. Uh, ultrasound is an operator-dependent test. I did ultrasound for a living. Uh, I know for a fact that people smarter than me couldn't do an ultrasound as well because they didn't know how to, I mean, it's just like, you know, playing the violin. I mean, so, you know, there is some skill to operating the device which uh, takes some experience, training, and an inclination to want to do it right is for, you know, do I want to play a violin or do I just want to make noise to irritate my parents? Um, anyway, um, so we have a bunch of rules that the medical students know and we can elaborate on those if you're interested. Um, but early spontaneous abortion, uh, we want to help the women. We have medications and drugs, all of which are now listed as abortion agents, in which we can help a woman having a spontaneous miscarriage. Uh, we know from clinical trials these medications make their uh, experience with the spontaneous miscarriage not last as many days. They don't lose as much blood. There are things we can do to help the women. We can't really make the miscarriage go away, uh, but we can certainly help the woman uh, have a better experience, and it's not a good experience, but uh, it can be less bad uh, with appropriate medication and intervention. And unfortunately, some people are reluctant to use those because they're listed as abortion agent. Or in Texas, some pharmacists are not filling those prescriptions for the women, even when they come in with the prescription, because they're afraid, I don't know what's going on, and I don't want to go to jail. So this is the problem we're having in Texas. Okay. So if a woman comes in with incomplete, inevitable miscarriage, here's what the medical students know. You can definitively take care of it with the DNC, which is in the operating room. If it's very, very early, uh, you can do what's called a suction uh, curatage in, in, the, in a clinic room, but that has to be earlier than six weeks. And uh, a lot of women that come to the hospital are, are beyond that. Uh, the medical issues is what I just mentioned. And uh, one thing that we've always done is, well, I'm not sure what's going on. Come back in two days and let's see what's happening. Because, you know, typically if it gets worse, you tell them, come back. The problem we have now in Texas is a lot of women are going out of state for certain things and they don't even have some place to go to while they're waiting. And so that's a different problem, which hadn't been in the news, but I can uh, just tell you talking to my colleagues, this is, this is a real issue. So this is just kind of a comparison of the medical versus surgical abortion. Um, 
this is all on the internet, approved by the FDA. You can find any of this. Um, but what I tell the medical students is uh, this is a complex matter. Make sure you uh, recognize that. Um, if you suspect you're involved with a patient who's having a miscarriage, wanted an abortion, might have had an abortion, go get the real doctor and get out of that situation because they're just medical students. They don't know. But unfortunately, our laws are written where anybody driving the car can be sucked into these, you know, uh, situations. Uh, as many of you know, there are now multiple counties in the state of Texas that have made it illegal for you to drive a woman through that county uh, if she plans on having an abortion. I don't know how they're going to enforce that, but it's, it's on the books and... Um, and I've read people want every county to have a law like that. So we'll see. And I think any of you who uh, are in this room probably keep up enough to know the whole issue of the exceptions and all that. Uh, it's been in all the courts. We've had lawsuits coming, and now uh, someone's petitioning the uh, Texas Medical Board to make a list. And... Um, if you're not confused already, let's wait till they make the list and it'll be really confusing. Uh, so these things are not always straightforward and that's part of the challenge. Uh, so I tell them, if you think you're in this, go ask your supervising physician and if you're still confused, go ask the dean of the medical school uh, because they have access to lawyers and all this kind of thing. So uh, with that, let's see how I did. Uh, everybody feel like they know basic human biology of how you get pregnant and where babies come from. Um, uh, hopefully you learned something about how we diagnose pregnancy you didn't know. Uh, I've introduced you to molar pregnancy, uh, giving you the terminology of the complications of early pregnancy and ectopic, and um, you know a little bit about the therapeutic options we have to deal with, and uh, we know there's ethical and legal issues involved.